So any kids up through the fifth grade can come up here and join me for just a minute. And we're going to talk a little bit about what I'll be preaching on later. And I'm going to clear a spot here. Oh, be careful. Have a seat right here. That'll be great. Awesome. Fantastic. Oh, good, good, good. All right, so listen. If I got everybody, okay. So, you know we've been doing a series on fishing, right? That's what we've been doing. We've been working through a whole series on fishing, talking about how Jesus came and he fished for his disciples and he made his disciples fishers of men. Now, we're going to talk about something today. Um, what happens if you hook a fish that's too big for you? Ah, that's, that's an important question. So, I've got an idea for an illustration. We're going to see if it works, okay? So, I tell you what, come here, Miller, come here, yeah, you're my first fish, get a seat right here, all right, there you go, good job, good job, no, you don't have to hold it, that's okay, we're going to hook you, just like, uh, I hooked the wrong thing, hang on, just like this, all right, I'm going to spool out a little line here for us, okay. You want to catch him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, you got him. See if you can reel him to you. Reel it. Oh, he's turning. He's fighting you. 
What's happening? It's just making noise. Hang on, I'm going to help you. Clunk, the fish is dead on the head, so now he's not fighting anymore. Reel him. Oh, we broke the line. <laughs> you were a much bigger fish than I anticipated. <laughs> All right, go ahead and have a seat. Now, there we go. Whoop, I caught you this time. All right, we're good? All right, we're good. So listen, you guys know I've got, I've got a little pond in my backyard, right? And with my pond, when I go and I, I cut grass around it, I will occasionally uh, find a bobber, I'll find a lure, I'll find different things that other fishermen have left behind. And do you want to know why? Because they didn't catch a fish that was too big, they caught a stump that was on the bottom. And what they had to do is they realized, I can't reel it in and go home. So what they had to do is they had to take their knife and they would cut the line and they would leave it all there. Well, eventually, fish, turtle, or something goes and pecks at it enough and it gets loose and it'll float up and end up on the shoreline of my, my pond. Now, what you heard when this thing was making that noise, see if we can make it again here. There, you hear it? That's called drag, and it's made so that you won't break your line. They don't want you to break the line, so they put that drag on there, and it keeps you from busting your line. But sometimes, you just have to. You have to pull out your pocket knife and cut the line so that you can go home. Now, yes, ma'am, you don't have pocket knives? I'll, I'll get you hooked up before you leave today. How's that? <laughs> We're good. It's all good. Okay. So, if you have a pocket knife, you use it and you cut the line. And what you have to do is you have to leave behind your lure, your hook, your bobber. All that's get left in the water because you can't walk away when it's hooked to a stump. Now, listen, this is what I want you to understand. When we follow Jesus, and you're going to hear me talking about some men who wanted to follow Jesus. When we follow Jesus, he will ask us sometimes to cut the line and leave behind some things so that we can follow him. And it's hard to do because maybe you paid a lot for that fishing lure or, or maybe you paid a lot for that bait or maybe you just don't like to lose bobbers. But sometimes you just have to cut loose in order to follow Jesus. So when you're asked to do something hard to follow him, whether it's to not gossip with a friend or not get in a fight at school or not do something. Be strong enough to turn loose of what you need to so that you can walk with Jesus. So as I'm preaching today, you listen for three things these men had to take uh, turn loose of. A net, a boat, and a father. Okay? Let's have a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you for these boys and girls. And Father, thank you for loving us enough that you turn loose of your son to come to this earth, to be able to walk this earth, but, Father, most of all, to die on this earth for our sins. Lord, I am so grateful that you were willing to give everything to save us. Help us to be willing to give up everything to follow you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just to show how much times have changed, my, my brother-in-law, Bo, and I used to work with a farmer Ask him if he had his pocket knife. He said, I've got my pants on, don't I? <laughs> Things change, don't they? Let's sing, He is So Precious to Me. Great song of testimony. So precious is Jesus, my Savior, my King. His praise all the day long with rapture I sing. For strength I can cling, for He is so precious to me. For He is so precious to me. For He is so precious to me. Tis heaven below, my Redeemer to know.
patiently waited an entrance to gain. What shame that so long he entreated in vain, for he is so precious to me. For he is so precious to me. Speaking of precious, we have some precious friends with us this morning, Ray and Gay and Jesse and Dale, they're coming to sing for us. Soldiers fighting Satan every day. We're standing up for Jesus while we're kneeling down to pray. If his precious blood has cleansed you and washed away your sin, that makes you a member of the blood washed band. Praise God, I'm a member of the blood washed band. I've been washed in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. I was bound by chains of sin till one day the Master came and made me a member of the blood-washed band. God's children are advancing, marching till we reach the goal. For the battle's almost over, we'll soon be going home. I can hear the sound of angels as the saints go marching in, singing praises to the captain of the blood wash band. Praise God, I'm a member of the blood wash band. I've been washed in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. I was bound by chains of sin Till one day the Master came And made me a member of the blood wash band Praise God, I'm a member of the blood wash band I've been washed in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb I was bound by chains of sin Till one day the Master came I tell you, I was, I was just about to compliment the performance, 
And then Dale walked up and said, don't worry about preaching. We'll just sing that again. <laughs> so clearly a compliment's not necessary. He already knows. Oh, my goodness. Well, listen, I know we've got some folks who are visiting with us today, so I want to make sure that I share with you, we are in the process of a series um, called Fishing. And in that series, we've been looking over in Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus went and called his disciples unto himself and said, I will make you fishers of men. Now, we have discussed several things in this process. Um, we began by talking about the fact that Jesus meets us where we are. Uh, Jesus always finds us where we're at. And, and so it doesn't matter what you've come in today from or, or where you think your life is, whether you think it's good, bad, or indifferent. Jesus is here to meet you today where you're at. The second thing we've learned in this series is that Jesus never leaves us where we're at. He calls us to where he is. And so we know that we can't be a follower of Christ without being in motion and following Christ. The third thing that we've discovered is that we are going to be made into something by him. It's not what we're going to make of ourselves with Jesus blessing us. It's about what Jesus creates out of us when we surrender everything to him. And so where we begin is never where we end. He is in the process of fashioning us into something new. Now, today we're going to discuss the concept that in order for him to make us into what he wants us to be, in order for us to follow him where he leads us, in order for us to leave where we're at and to go to where he is, we've got to turn loose of some things within our lives. Now, these are hard things to do, difficult decisions to make. As I shared with the kids, at our little pond, when I go around and, and, and start weed eating or whatever, I'll find those lures. I, I can still remember two or three nice ones that I found in the trees. Now, I'm not sure what they were casting for in the sky, but they didn't catch it. They caught the branches instead. And so at some point, whatever kid was fishing said, you know what, I'll have to buy a new one, and cut the line, and he went home. And sometimes the things that we're leaving behind are not the things we want to leave behind. We're attached to them. They're precious to us, or we're just used to them. But the truth is you can't take another step going on until you turn loose of the things where you're at. And so today, I want you to return with me to that shoreline. Matthew chapter 4, beginning there in verse 18, as the gospel writer records the event. There, Matthew states, as Jesus was walking along beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called to them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, as you and I look at the passage, I want you to first take note that the disciples respond word for word in obedience with Christ. They give accurate, specific, word for word response to Jesus. Now, how do I know that? Well, because in the passage, you see the word that is used to go, imi in the Greek, multiple times, and always in connection between what Jesus says and what the disciples do. The Greek verb, imi, is used by Jesus in verse 19 when he says, come and follow me. The Greek word that is used there, imi, is used in the command form. It is to call forward, you come, you follow. It is a command from Christ to the disciples. Now, interestingly, when you move on to the verse where they respond, the same Greek term is used, but it is used in a different form, indicating a response from them. Now, why is this important? Because they are word for word in step with Jesus. Now, listen, don't, don't miss this. We're just starting off, so catch hold of this. 
We are called to give exact obedience, precise obedience to our Savior, Jesus. Now, we give, I'm going to call it general obedience as believers. We happen to be there, so we talk to somebody about Jesus. We happen to be in the church, so we worship God. But we happen to be in different places. It's a part of our culture. It's a part of our family traditions. It's a part of all these other things about our life. And so we just happen to be in the area, and so we're in obedience to Christ. That's not obedience to Christ. Obedience to Christ is hearing specifically what he's calling you to do and giving specific obedience in response. Now, now listen, we live in a world today where apathetic obedience will kill your faith. We have an entire nation and society that says, hey, we love Jesus, but we still embrace this sin. We will love Christ, but we will still follow these traditions of mankind, our our society, our culture. We want to walk with Jesus, but we don't want to walk that narrow way. Don't be so specific and so narrow-minded, right? Well, folks... There's no other way to follow Jesus except word for word with him. Step for step with him. And that's what the apostles did. That's what the disciples did. They walked with him in obedience word for word. The other thing I want you to know about that little Greek word, in me, okay, is that the form that it is used in actually has an indicator that they were in route or going And then something stops them. And so the word actually kind of means to go again. So think of it this way. The disciples are on their way, and they see the boats and lake, and they stop there and they work. Okay? Then Jesus, as he meets them, calls them to go again. And so they have to remove whatever obstacle is holding them and follow him on the next phase. We get this also from the context of the passage, and I know we're doing a lot with Greek here, so you just hang in there, all right? But in chapter 3 of the book of Matthew, Jesus is going to be baptized, but John is in the way, right? And Jesus says to him, let it be for now, and then he goes and is baptized. The obstacle, John, is removed, and Jesus continues to go in his Father's will. You can also see it there in chapter 4. Jesus goes into the wilderness where he is meditating and praying and fasting. And then Satan gets into the middle of it, right? And there's a, a blockage in the process until finally he is done with Satan and it says Satan left him for that time and he was able to go on his way. So Jesus... It says, in two different locations, removes an obstacle and continues on the path. Well, the same is going on with the disciples. They're going. They stop because there's work to be done. Then Jesus calls to them. They have to remove the obstacle and continue forward. So what are the obstacles that are there? We know there are three. There is a net, there is a boat, and there is a father. Just like I told the kids. And these three things are not bad, but they are obstacles in being obedient to Christ. So let's talk about that respond. They not only respond word for word with Jesus, but they're going to respond by letting go. I'm not talking frozen and all of that now, but we are talking about turning loose. There in verse 20, Peter and Andrew prepare to follow Christ by releasing their nets. The scripture says there um, in verse 19, uh, he says, come follow me. And Jesus said, I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets, verse 20, and they followed him. They can't follow him with the nets. They have to let them go. Now, I know you may say, well, that's not a big deal. Just drop them and head on. But, but listen, this is, this is so important because these nets are so much more than just nets. These nets are how they make their living. This is the way that they put food on the table. 
They put clothes on their back. This is how they put a roof over their head. This is all of their provision. They're not growing corn and wheat and soy. They're growing, I don't know, salmon and cod and whatever else they can pull. And that's why, by the way, they're using nets. They're not using fishing poles like us. We have guys who have fishing poles and they call themselves fishermen. Well, unless you're being sponsored by Bass Pro, you're not going to make a living hauling in three or four bass a day. You're going to have to use a net. And you're going to throw those nets out and you're going to pull in as many fish as you possibly can. Because again, those fish are not just for your table. They are for everything that your life is provided. So for them to drop these nets is akin to allowing a mechanic to drop his snap-on toolbox and all of its tools. For those of you who are not mechanics and don't know snap-on, you have no idea of the value of that. It, it, it is the most important thing of their profession, and they are turning it loose. But there's more to it. It's not just that it's their provision. It is their identity. This is who they are. It says they're working their nets for they were fishermen. Their identity of who they are is tied up in what they do, which is the net. This is their identity as a person. And they are going to lay it aside and follow Jesus. Now, some of you may not be old enough yet to, to sort this out. But I can tell you, the older you get and the more you look at the stuff you've got to turn loose of, the more you realize how much of your identity you've put into the things that you've built or made or worked for. It was just a few weeks ago, we were uh, moving our stuff across, you know. And I had some stuff in my office over there across the street. And it was in my upper filing cabinet. And I hadn't looked at it in probably seven, eight years. And it, it was Bible studies and sermons and curriculum that I had done when I got out of college, when I first started preaching in the, in the first church I went to. I mean, it was all of my printouts from my computer with dot matrix printer. And I looked at them and said, I, I, I'll see if there's a space. And I carried them across. I realized there's no space in my office to put those things in. Then I realized I couldn't ask Ken Colley to make space for something I hadn't looked at in seven years. And I realized at that point the only option is to throw it away. Now I had worked for hours, days, weeks, months on the curriculum and the sermons and the handwritten notes, even the the clear overhead projection slides. And Lori was in the office that day, and I walked around the corner. She was sitting at the desk, and the trash can was there. And I said, this is hard. And I just threw it in the trash. Why would it be so hard? You haven't looked at it in seven years, David. The Bible hasn't changed. You'll still be able to preach. The sermons will still come. If you were to use any of it, you'd have to update all of it. Why is it difficult to do? Because it's a part of me. But I couldn't follow him here if I didn't throw it there. All of us are going to reach that place. There's going to come a time when you're going to need to decide between your physical comfort and your provision materially and your call to Jesus. There's going to come a time when you are going to have to decide whether your identity is in the stuff you've done or in the Savior you serve. You're going to have to choose because Christ is always moving and our society is never in step with Him. Can you let go of the net to follow Him? Secondly, you got James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Now, now they're in something, and it's a boat. And I know you guys have boats, right? Some of you have the little, you know, skiff runabout things. Some of y'all have bass boats, like serious boats, okay? Maybe you got a pontoon boat. God bless you. That's awesome. 
My understanding of boats is that they're a hole in the water you throw money in. Is that accurate? But anyways, this boat was more than all of that. Do you know what it was? It was home. You got to remember, they're fishermen. Zebedee was a fisherman. That means that from the age of three or four, they were probably in the boat with Zebedee. Can you imagine them working around, trying not to be caught in the net as it goes over the gunnels? Can you imagine them seeing the fish coming into the boat at three and four years of age? Can you imagine them as elementary school kids having gone out with their dad and pulling the fish in? Can you imagine as teenagers them being with Zebedee as he's pulling them in and realizing their, their cut of the profits, their take to bring home, they're working out the business. And those guys knew every crack and every crevice. They knew where they had put in where the holes were and they had pitched them solid. They knew every moment of space in that ship. That was their home. In the darkest gale, they could have found their way from one side of it to the other, from the front and to the back. They would have known where every piece of equipment was. This was where they lived. And they were comfortable. They were as comfortable on the water as they were off because that was home. And the scripture says Jesus called them and said, come, follow me. And they step out of their home and they go with him. From that point forward, they don't have a home location. They'll go from town to town and village to village. They will move constantly. The only time that we read of any of them finding a place where they stay is John when he reaches the Isle of Patmos because he has been exiled. They're constantly on the move. As a matter of fact, they don't know what home is except that the presence of Christ is there. He is their new home. The best illustration of that is in the last week of Jesus' life. Jesus calls them to go find a place for them. And he tells them what? Go down to 3rd Street and turn right. You'll see the sign for rentals available. And there'll be a place there that you should check in. I read about it on an Airbnb. I'm sure it'll work for our Last Supper. Instead, what he said was go to a place you've never seen, talk to a guy you've never met, and go to a room you've never been into. And the only indicator of all of it was look for a donkey tied outside. Their home was Jesus in obedience to him. They didn't live anywhere but in his presence. You know, for us, church is home. Maybe you grew up in this place, and you're struggling right now because we're not in the same place that we've always called home. Maybe you're struggling because we're doing different things or, or doing different methods or engaging different programs Maybe you're just struggling because we're, we're seeing new faces and new individuals. And home isn't what it used to be. It's not the same as it always has been. But is it in obedience to Christ? Then it's still home. Are we willing to let our home go so that we can follow Him? I know in a few months, Hunter mentioned to you, we're going to do the gospel to every home. And we're going to leave this home and we're going to go out to share the gospel with people in our community. And some of you, as soon as I say that statement, you've turned the lights out. The eyes are open, but the brain is gone. And the reason is because you say, listen, I'll share Jesus in the church. I'll share Jesus in my Sunday school classroom. I'll tell people about Jesus here at home. But don't ask me to leave my home and tell somebody about Christ. Do you realize you can be just as much at home on the doorstep of an individual you've never met as you can right here? Because you are in obedience to Christ. Are you willing to let go of your comfort in order to walk with our Christ? Third thing, they had to leave Zebedee. Now, I had somebody after last service come up and say, what did Zebedee's mean, need, well, uh, name mean? And, and you guys know they were called the sons of thunder, okay? Well, it might be that Zebedee had quite a temper. I don't know. 
It might be that he was just hard of hearing, and so he yelled at everybody that he met. But the one thing I do know is that their dad was special to them. Do you realize that in the Jewish world, they didn't have last names? Their last name was their dad's first name. So you wouldn't be called David Tucker. You would be called David, son of Elton. The name of your father was your identity. And so for them to walk away from their dad is not only to walk away from the relationship they've always known, but it was to walk away from the identity, again, that their society gave them. Are we willing to walk away from a relationship that's that important? Would we be willing to to step away from a relationship that we know isn't where God wants us to be, but it's what we've always known? I know that for some of y'all, you've got a friend who is a good friend, but they are not good spiritually for you. There are some of you that have a good neighbor, and they are a good neighbor, but they are also a good gossip, and they keep drawing you into stuff that you need not be. There are some of you that may be dating somebody, a guy or a gal, and they're a good person, but they are not growing you in Christ. Would you be willing to turn loose of that kind of relationship in order to make sure you hold on to your relationship with Jesus? Many of us talk about it in church. Very few of us will do it when we walk out of those doors. You want to know why? Because those things are anchors in our life. And you have to weigh anchor if you're going to move your ship. The disciples weighed anchor. They dropped nets, stepped out of a boat, and they walked away from a man that they had always known. They turned loose of the things that were powerfully heavy in their life because they were going to follow a singular Lord. And his name is Jesus. Let me tell you something about anchors. Anchors are are the most, I'm going to say, open-minded tool you'll ever find. Open-minded meaning they don't care what they attach to. They have no preference. An anchor is not simply a weight. If you look at anchors, they always have hooks and other things that are supposed to grab hold of what's ever down below. And do you know what an anchor cares about? Nothing when it grabs hold. It doesn't care if it grabs hold of something beautiful or ugly. It doesn't care if it grabs hold of something new or old. It doesn't care if it grabs hold of something valuable or completely worthless. All the anchor does is it grabs hold of whatever it finds so that it will hold whatever's on the surface from moving forward. Satan doesn't care what anchor he uses in your life. Satan does not care what anchor he can manipulate into your life. It may be something beautiful. It may be something ugly. It may be something valuable. It may be something worthless. But he's going to ask you to grab hold of that and maintain that for one reason only, so that you'll watch Jesus walk on down the shoreline and you will stay right where you're at. I told you I had that question from somebody in, sec- in the first service, and they said, you know, why was he called Thunder? Was he a mean guy, Zebedee? I said, I don't know. Like I said, he might have been just hard of hearing. But I will say this. Have you ever stopped to ask if the call to follow Christ was given to Zebedee as well? He was in the boat with the other two. He was on the shore with the other four. But he stayed and they left. Could it be that could have been an apostle Zebedee 
if he had been willing to step out of his home, give up his identity, and follow Jesus. Today, it's time to make a choice to weigh anchor. Not simply as a church, but for you in your walk with Christ. Let's have a word of prayer.